Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar in our Blockchain at Butzel series, The Dark Side of Crypto, Navigating Cybersecurity Incidents and Ransom Demands. During this afternoon's presentation, please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the Zoom Q&A panel. A copy of this presentation and recording will be made available sometime in the next 24 hours on our webinar event page on Butzel.com. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and to introduce our presenters, Butzel Long shareholders, William Kraus and Claudia Rast, and from N1 Discovery, Scott Bailey. Bill? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, hello and welcome back to Blockchain at Butzel. As Jonathan said, this is the fourth webinar in our series, The Dark Side of Crypto, Navigating Cybersecurity Incidents and Ransom Demands. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I am very excited to be joined here by shareholder and chair of the Intellectual Property, Cybersecurity and Emerging Technology Group, Claudia Rast. Claudia brings a wealth of experience regarding cybersecurity and ransomware situations, and I'm excited for her views today. Uh, we're also joined today by Scott Bailey of N1 Discovery, a recognized expert in digital forensics, cybersecurity, and incident response, among other areas. And I believe this is going to be a great discussion. Um, Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind taking us to the first slide. So the format of today's webinar is going to be a bit different than the first three blockchain at Butzel webinars, and I'll be acting as a moderator for our discussion here. In broad strokes, our discussion is going to proceed as follows. First, we're going to talk about Colonial Pipeline, a you know, very timely and noteworthy incident involving cybersecurity and ransomware. We're going to talk about how a cybersecurity might play out in you know, a hypothetical scenario and what a business might see. And we're going to get Claudia and Scott's views on the critical things that an organization must do in response to an attack. We'll then go over a couple of um, key areas such as best practices with regard to negotiation, law enforcement, other legal regulatory points to keep in mind. We're just going to try to bring you know, the wealth of experience that we have here um, to bear and you know, in a way that's open and approachable for businesses who are concerned about this space um, or perhaps trying to prepare for a cybersecurity incident in the future. Um, and to that end, we're going to talk at the end about what businesses and individuals should be doing to prepare for attacks now, and we'll open the floor for audience questions. So to that end, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A function, um, post questions as we go along, and we'll try to answer those at the end. So with that, let's get started. Um, Jonathan, if you could do the next slide, please. All right, so let's discuss a, um, you know, recent high sort of high attention event in the news. Um, Colonial Pipeline, I don't think anybody at this point has not heard of Colonial Pipeline. And if you haven't, then here's a quick background. Um, there have been several high profile cybersecurity incidents in just the last few weeks. And this is an area that I think businesses need to be paying attention to because in part of what we saw with this. Just a few weeks ago, um, one of the nation's largest pipelines for refined gasoline and jet fuel spanning 5,500 miles from Texas to New York was shut down in response to a ransomware attack. And I put the little map here on the slide so you can see just how far this pipeline actually goes and all of the urban areas and terminals and cities that this hits, not um, and including a number of large airports um, like Hartfield and Atlanta and Charlotte. Um, this pipeline was responsible for roughly 45% of the East Coast fuel supplies, and we saw fuel shortages at major airports, and we also saw shortages slash panic buying in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, among other places. In fact, it's estimated that around 85% of gas stations in Washington, D.C. ran out of fuel, and we saw here in Michigan and elsewhere average national fuel prices rise um, in some places their highest level since 2014. In the aftermath, it had come to light that Darkseid, a hacking group, attacked computerized equipment managing the ability to bill customers and also stole about 100 gigabytes worth of data from the Colonial Pipeline company. In response, Colonial Pipeline preemptively shut down the pipeline, leading to the fuel shortages that I've described. Within hours of the attack, the company then paid a ransom of roughly 75 Bitcoin, which is around 4.55 million at the time, in exchange for software that was intended to bring the system back online. Fortunately, that software proved to work so slowly, the Colonial Pipeline ended up using their own backups to restore the system. 
Jonathan, if we go to the next slide, please. So I talked about Bitcoin as, you know, sort of the mechanism through which the colonial pipeline ransomware was paid. Does that mean that digital assets like Bitcoin are only used by people trying to escort ransom from companies? No, of course not. Um, as we've discussed in previous webinars, I believe that digital assets have tremendous legitimate applications for individuals and businesses. However, um, we have to acknowledge, and I, I think I have in the past, that digital assets are also used for illicit purposes, just like cash can be used to buy illegal items or art is used to sometimes facilitate money laundering. You know, this is something that we need to be cognizant of. So what should we know, and this is just a background for our sort of discussion about digital assets and the use, their use in illicit um, activity? Well, I think first, um, there's a vulnerability that governments and regulators are looking at in so much as digital assets allow large amounts of value to be moved extremely quickly outside of the traditional financial system. So here I always like to think of the movies, right, where they say, you know, pay us in unmarked, you know, $100 bills. And there's always a bag like the one in the picture there that somebody comes and, you know, drops outside the airplane or whatnot. That isn't the case with digital assets. I mean, these really can be transmitted tens, hundreds, millions of dollars or more in a matter of minutes to anywhere around the world without the involvement of ordinary financial channels like having to go to a bank and get cash or facilitate a wire transfer. Moreover, it's interesting because it's verifiable. Again, thinking back to the movies, right? You go and you, you get that bag and there's a bunch of hundreds on top and ones or paper or something like that on the bottom or a die pack. Not the case with Bitcoin. A criminal can see almost immediately when funds are sent and confirmed to be received on the blockchain. Once sent and confirmed, that transmission is also permanent and can't be reversed or pulled back. I think there's also some concern, and I think this is right, around pseudo anonymity of digital assets. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, a lot of folks in the public will hear Bitcoin being used in situations like Colonial Pipeline and assume that this is a completely anonymous way of moving funds. And that's only half true. Um, in Bitcoin, as just one example, transactions are publicly viewable. They're traceable using Bitcoin's blockchain. And as a practical matter, that means that coins paid in ransom can actually be followed as they change hands, although there are, of course, methods that bad actors use to make that more difficult. What is more difficult to determine, however, is the ultimate owner or owners of the wallets holding or receiving the coins at issue. For this reason, we sometimes see situations where ransoms paid in Bitcoin will actually sit in wallets for years and years without being spent because they're being monitored and tracked. Um, the Bitfinex, as one example, suffered a very high profile hack a couple of years ago, and those coins are thought to be the most monitored in the world. None of them have been spent. Um, this is obviously different than a duffel bag full of cash, um, which could be immediately spent in exchange with minimal traceability. Now, on the other hand, there are digital assets um, other than Bitcoin. And I've said before, there's thousands of tokens out there, and some do offer anonymity, um, complete anonymity almost. And I think that that can give rise to a policy discussion that is going to unplay now and or play out now and in the future about what we should do with cryptocurrencies or digital assets intended to be fully anonymous. That said, I know that governments and law enforcement agencies are becoming increasingly sophisticated with regard to this technology and tracking digital assets. This could be a webinar in its own right, but suffice it to say that governments are developing their own technology and methods in this area, as well as looking to the private sector um, to use software and approaches built out like chain analysis um, and other means of tracking these assets. And then more generally, um, and I'll stop talking, I, I think that we're seeing increased government attention in this area, not just in how we monitor and surveil and track, but I think we're going to see government pushback, more aggressive pursuit of bad actors, and maybe even sort of counteractions um, as it regards to ransomware. As an example, uh, Claudia had gone and forwarded me a um, timely, I think it was Wall Street Journal article today, talking about how when the Colonial Pipeline event unplayed, it really represented an attack on national infrastructure, and that's a problem for national security. In the wake of that attack, there are some indications that groups like DarkSide are now trying to lay low, and I think it's going to be interesting, at least for me, to see what happens over the coming months and years if governments of the world, like the United States, decide that this is a national security thing that we need to focus on and push back on. How long that lasts, where it goes, is for anyone to say, but um, certainly an interesting area to be looking at right now. 
So Jonathan, if you wanna take down the slides now, I think we can go and shift to the panel discussion uh, segment. Um, and I think we've got a good foundation to dive in. So my first question is, what does this typical attack look like from the perspective of business on the receiving end? Uh, Scott or Claudia, could you perhaps provide a hypothetical example for our audience on how an attack might play out and you know, cover how does it start, how attackers might make contact, what happens next, what does this look like for the business owner or the IT professional um, who sees this happen in real time? Sure, thanks, William. I'll start with a hypothetical and uh, get us to the point where somebody at the company is going to probably call their attorney. Um, so the hackers today are 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 getting extremely sophisticated. Um, they are they are in most cases toe to toe with our with most people's IT staff, and then oftentimes probably even more sophisticated than companies' IT staff. Um, you know, the traditional phishing is still obviously very prevalent, but um, you know, the thing that the hackers are doing are constantly probing. They're constantly looking for systems that are misconfigured, um, ports that are left open. Uh, in the case of, I mean, our most recent one was the vulnerabilities that were identified in the Exchange server, right? Uh, Microsoft publicly discloses the vulnerability, puts a patch out, but the hackers were all over that and they were compromising system after system. So once they find a system that has some sort of a vulnerability. Um, and a lot of times it's it's an open port like a remote desktop port that gets left open and uh, unsecured. Um, they are pretty much immediately in the system. They gain that foothold. Once they gain that foothold, uh, then they also sometimes then try to make sure that they have a backdoor into the system. So even if they are found out um, and that is shut down and you think you're safe, they've already put a backdoor in your system so that they can come back in. They usually spend today, um, a lot of the hackers usually spend about two weeks in the system. So they are probing your network for usually up to two weeks. Uh, they're learning everything to know about your company. They're learning where your data is. More importantly, they're learning where your backups are and they're, they're devising a plan on how to cripple your network. While all that is going on, there's usually another part of the hacking group that's exfiltrating data. So as they're wandering through your system, and they're identifying all of your information assets, they're deciding what are they going to exfiltrate. So they identify all of your personal information, your employee files, maybe uh, customer databases with credit card information, social security numbers, whatever the case may be. Um, they are exfiltrating that data. So once their plan is in place, once they've exfiltrated all the data that they want, because that's what they're gonna use to, um, to extort you, um, and once they feel that they can quickly take over your network and they know where your backups are, they launch the attack. The attack usually happens in the middle of the night because we're not working, right? Even if alarms start going off, most companies don't have staff to react. So they launch the ransomware usually in the middle of the night and it starts encrypting your systems servers, desktops, whatever they want to target is what they're going to do. And often the first sign, that there's an issue is somebody usually at first thing in the morning, they try to connect to check their email or something. And then they send a, a message to IT, hey, the email server's down, right? And that usually spawns the first sign that there's trouble, but the IT staff doesn't even realize it. And then they start, usually the IT staff starts piecing things together and realizing that, that this is a bigger issue than just like a server down. Uh, and that's usually when obviously management's notified and that is usually when um, the call is made and usually the call is made to their attorney. So Claudia, you wanna take it from there? Well, and, and this is where the, the interesting is back and forth because as Scott says, sometimes they call the attorney, sometimes they call uh, the forensic people. So um, the important thing to know in, in the sort of order of, of uh, events here is that in any of these situations, you need to have good forensic people. Um, and generally that would not include the IT staff because the IT staff are, are not in that daily trench of dealing with security and forensics. They're dealing with um, break fix, connectivity, those kinds of things. Um, and so they don't have the expertise. So when the client calls me for one of these things, I say, okay, we need forensic people on site pronto. 
Um, do you have anybody on hand or do you need a recommendation? Um, and if the call goes to Scott, you know, what is your comment, Scott? Uh, normally, I mean, and we do get a lot of the clients, you know, do call us directly. We are the first call. Um, and literally our first comment to them is we need a cyber attorney. Who is your cyber attorney? Your business attorney usually will not suffice for us in these cases. Uh, you need an attorney that specializes in these cyber type of attacks because you want everything that we do to both be controlled by the attorney to make sure we're doing everything that we're, we're required to do and that it's all obviously protected. So, Right, so those, those are the first kinds of calls, making sure that you have cyber, cyber attorney and forensic uh, folks in play. And then the, the really next important call is, do you have insurance? And does it, is it a cyber liability policy? Um, you know, and as Scott is describing, the threat actors are going in and looking at the network, they're getting very good about finding whether you have cyber liability insurance because we're all digitizing our assets, right? Um, so they find the cyber policy, they know how much um, the, the, the insured is willing to pay. Um, so they know what kind of ransom to um, demand and that it could be covered. Um, so that can be initially um, an issue. So it's really important to get that claim filed if, if the uh, client has insurance. If they don't have insurance, um, that can be a problem because the cost, depending on what the impact is on their business, uh, those costs can mount pretty quickly. And one thing to, to keep in mind on the insurance, and Scott and I have both been down this road, is insurance companies often have what they call paneled vendors. And those would be vendors that the insurance company have previously basically vetted. They are on call. That's all they do is respond to that particular insurance company's insureds in the event of a cyber attack. And the important thing to keep in mind, and, and again, Scott and I have, have been there, is that those paneled vendors, their client is the insurance company. Their client is not the victim of the threat actor. Um, and that can have some very interesting consequences going down in terms of the advice that's given um, down the road. So when these things initially happen, we have a forensic person, we have cyber counsel, uh, we have insurance. Um, and let's just you know, take this uh, assumption, Scott, that, that you and I are, are both involved in this event. The ransomware demand has been made. It's in the millions of dollars. Um, what do you do? Oh, Bill, did you want to say that? That's, that's great background. I mean, that's exactly where I'd like to go with this. Um, so, I mean, we have our hypothetical scenario, right? Somebody logs in, you know, Joe, the early riser, tries to check his email at 6 a.m. An email comes across or calls made because the email system's down that the system's not working. IT folks, as a first step, start trying to figure out the scope of the problem is. I think you guys have identified, you know, the first types of calls to be making. What other considerations should businesses be doing or going through? What should they be um, trying to figure out and handle first? Well, you, you have competing, competing issues. So your, you know, your first issue from the standpoint of the incident is preserving evidence right? Preserving everything we possibly can so that we can understand and, 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 um, and piece together, how did the hackers get in? What were they doing while they were in your system? What data did they access? What data did they exfiltrate? You know, all this type of information from the investigation standpoint and the information that the attorneys need is really important to understand, but that directly competes with my God, we got to get our business back operational, right? Yeah. And um, we've got to figure out how to communicate with our customers. We have to do all this. So you have these two competing things and you're trying to balance, you know, um, actually both of them. And the, the worst thing that can happen is when the IT staff doesn't, doesn't notify management soon enough um, or the IT staff tries to start fixing it themselves. Um, so they can destroy a lot of the evidence, a lot of the log files. Uh, we've had situations where um, without even telling management, somebody in IT already contacts the hackers to say, okay, how much is the ransom? 
Um, you know, but the problem is what people don't understand is as soon as that uh, initial communication is made to the hacker to find out what the ransom is, the clock starts and there's usually a time limit. It's usually, it can be 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever the case may be that if the ransom is not paid within that time frame, the ransom in most cases goes up 20 times. So if the IT staff makes that first connection to the hackers to find out what the ransom amount is, the clock starts. Oftentimes, the, the forensic people and the attorneys were not we're not even involved until a day, maybe two days later. Yeah. And now you're really under the gun to try to to make things happen. Yeah, and some other competing issues there would be if you've got, I mean, you've got a a, a clock going for the threat actors. You've got. Um, notification obligations in, in states. There are num we have 50 states, DC and, and three territories um, with varying uh, notification deadlines. And if there are international implications, we have GDPR and potential 72 hour notifications. Um, then you also have various um, government entities in, in Michigan, for example, we have an insurance um, statute that addresses data breaches and they want 10 business days to have a notification. Um, and Scott, so, you know, when these things happen, don't the threat actors lay it all out in a nice spreadsheet of what they have and what kind of PII it is or PHI or whatever in, in, a, in an easy sort. So all you have to do is push, send it to the attorney to analyze. Yeah, unfortunately, they don't. And uh, oftentimes, you don't even know what they have until it's published on the dark web. Um, so as part of that investigation, it's, again, trying to figure out what systems did that hackers actually laterally move to? What were they doing on that system? And obviously, was their data being exfiltrated out? A lot of times, forensically, we can determine all that. Um, and we can, we can figure out what is the data set that they took. And then obviously we can look at that data set and see what is actually in there. Um, but sometimes if the client doesn't have um, uh, a, a, a well-designed IT system uh, with logging and all the necessary things, it can be an impossible task. You may never know what the hackers did because you have nothing to look at inside the network. So then you're flying blind. What did, you know, did they exfiltrate data or did they not? Of course, the threat is now, the threat, the, the threat with ransomware started with, you know, hey, if you want your data on your system unencrypted, pay us the ransom and we'll send you the decryption keys, right? That's the traditional thing that's always been done. Well, now the hackers have just in the last couple of years have kind of switched their tactics now too. So, because a lot of companies are doing a very good job with backups and um, they don't have to pay the ransom if they get hit, they just restore from backup. So the hackers are losing their, 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 their money stream. So now what they're saying is, okay, okay, you don't need to pay us for, to get the decryption keys, but if you don't want us to post the data on the dark net, you have to pay the ransom anyway. So that's the second piece of the puzzle now that's starting to happen to people. Um, and, and I can tell you for a fact on cases that we have worked where for whatever reason, um, the client um, either could not or chose not to pay the ransom, uh, six days later, all of their data was published on the dark web. So it, it is a threat that the hackers do follow through on. Yeah, and, and the other um, bit of difficulty there is if the threat actor has been identified as someone who's on the specially designated individuals list for Department of Treasury, because the OFAC guidance that was issued last October basically said, if they are on this list, um, we are going to come after you with enforcement. You meaning the insurance company, the forensic company, the lawyers, the company itself. Uh, to, if you pay that money, if you negotiate with those, if you negotiate with those folks, we are going to, to um, enforce, um, take enforcement action against you. So in those situations, um, we tend to back off because as uh, vendors that do this kind of thing on a regular basis, we do not want to have enforce enforcement actions against us. And that leaves the victim company with nowhere to go. Right. And if you don't have backups, what are you going to do? Yeah. No, I think that's a really interesting you know, point. 
um, you know, for the uninitiated OFAC is Office of Foreign Assets Control, right? It's organization that we've talked about, um, you know, in a previous webinar. And essentially, you know, this means that if you were to go and just, you know, arbitrarily pay the Bitcoin or whatever was, you know, requested as a ransom, you might have gone and unintentionally, you know, contributed to the funding of terrorism or um, paid some other bad actor. If you made a payment that ended up in North Korea or Iran, you would have very real consequences. So I think this is a, is a good sort of moment to pause and step back. I mean, for businesses, the practical guidance seems to be stop, you know, have your IT folks take stock, immediately report it higher up as soon as possible. And as soon as they recognize what they're dealing with, try to go and have an informed approach to what to do cognizant of having to balance the need to get back online, service your business, et cetera, contact experts and professionals, forensic folks, attorneys who can help you navigate this situation because there are a number of pitfalls here, um, you know, both legally and, you know, in, in, in terms of just handling the technological problem. Is that fair or is there anything you guys would add? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that is absolutely fair because the two things, um, and, and we've seen this before, where a company gets hit, with ransomware, the IT staff says, don't worry about it. We have good backups, which they do. Um, and they get the systems fully restored. Now, there's two problems with that. The first problem is that they don't know if there's any back doors. So we had one situation where as soon as they got the system back up and running, the hackers came back in through the back door they planted and re-encrypt the system a second time. Yeah. Um, and then the, the, you know, the other issue with that is you restore your whole system and then you call the attorney. Now, the problem is chances are all the evidence is gone. So now for reporting purposes, what do you do? Cause you don't even know what they took. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important because if the evidence is gone, the default is notify. You have to, the, the assumption is the default assumption is that that there has been access and exfiltration because you don't have any evidence to prove that it didn't happen. Um, so that's why having that preservation is in place is, is extremely important. The other mm -hmm. thing to, to note about, about OFAC and this sort of tendency, particularly coming, um, there are two, two points with Colonial Pipeline that, that's interesting. And, and one is, um, and we can talk about this in a bit too, that dark side ultimately decides to disband and, and it'll pop up at some other place, presumably. but. But the FBI, um, the office in, um, in San Francisco has been working uh, the dark side uh, investigation since last August when it popped up. And it's very interesting that um, apparently our government uh, had a call with Russia who is supposedly affiliated or dark side is affiliated with Russian um, actors. Um, and I don't know whether the Russians did it, whether we did it, but their Bitcoin wallet seemed to be emptied of all the, the currency that they had, the cryptocurrency from the Colonial Pipeline, and they couldn't access their, their servers <laughs> with the data that they apparently had exfiltrated, um, which sort of goes to the article that I, that I sent in the Wall Street Journal uh, to you, Bill and, and Scott, about how um, it's sort of like, oh, we want to do this a little more subtly than getting the big headlines because now, DHS announcing just an hour ago that they, they have certain regulations now they're going to put on pipeline um, um, industry. And, and the other thing that, and this is where legislators don't know what goes on in the trenches, they basically say, well, don't pay the ransom, just don't pay it. And, and that leaves a lot of companies with, um, you know, between a rock and a hard place, um, just and this is interesting, right? I mean, you've you've got your email servers down, and you're worried about you know the blueprints to your your widget going up on the dark web. You don't imagine, I think, most people that you could be in the middle of a geopolitical situation, right, or sort of <laughs> tiptoeing into an international incident. Um, and that's you know that's some of the things that these you know professionals you know have to think about for you know these companies. And I'm going to ask a, a tough question. Should I just go pick up the phone and, and call the FBI when something happens? Well, I'll I'll give you the I'll let Laura, uh, uh, Claudia give you the legal answer, um, but I think the the important thing is to set the proper the proper expectations, right? I think unfortunately a lot of people think yes, all I all I have to do is pick up the phone and call 
the my local law enforcement or the FBI, um, and they will take care of everything. And and that's just not how it works, right? I mean, we have to understand what is law enforcement's purpose. Law enforcement purpose is to catch the bad guys. Right. Their job is not to make sure you're back operational. Their job is to not get your systems back up. Their job is not to help you pay the ransom. Their job is to get the bad guys. That's what they care about. Now, if they can help you as that goes along and give you some information that maybe helps, they, they absolutely will. But, you know, a lot of people have this misconception of what they're going to do. Yeah, and, and that's absolutely true, Scott. And, but I will note that there's a little bit of a difference. There's a new sheriff in town, um, kind of, and we're getting from CISA, the Cybersecurity Information uh, Security Agency, um, and DHS and FBI, all are a little more interested in getting information from private sectors. Mm -hmm. um, and in so doing, they're also a little more willing to share information about how to protect um, uh, companies. And so there's a, a little bit more give and take. We, we in, in a recent matter with DarkSide and a client about two months ago, um, contacted, I contacted the FBI. Um, they were interested. They put me in touch. And that, that was the public um, coordinator, uh, public sector coordinator for the FBI office in Detroit, um, who put me in touch with a special agent who who contacted the group in San Francisco, the FBI group that was um, uh, basically heading up the investigation of Darkside, who gave us information of, of what Darkside would do uh, when we didn't pay the ransom. And with that information, we were, we were prepared for the DDoS attacks, the distributed denial of service attacks um, that they typically did when they were not happy. Um, and we also provided them, Scott's team provided them with indicators of compromise and other sorts of screenshots of the kind of um, uh, the email back and forth. Um, so there, there is a, um, a give and take there. Um, but the, the first call you make is not necessarily the one to the FBI. The first call you need to make is, is again, as we said, Cyber Council and, and your forensic people to get them in, in line. So they are used to that because that's, that's a really an important part of that process. And I think that's, that's sort of the key takeaway. And, and please correct me if you have a different view. Um, I think folks should recognize, right, that you have these competing sort of tensions and these interests and law enforcement can very much be, you know, an asset in this area. And you might even have obligations under certain circumstances. So of course, this is a highly fact dependent question to go and notify, you know, a government agency or, um, you know, a law enforcement agency. But you need to sort of have someone help you navigate this. I think the point that folks should take away is this is an extremely complex scenario um, today. These are sophisticated attackers, and there's a lot of regulation around this and a lot of competing concerns. So um, I think your insights are, are very helpful to um, sort of illustrate that. Well, and to, to one other point, too, just to kind of give you an idea where things can head, um, you know, the the hackers are, are definitely getting bolder. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had a client that um, could not pay the ransom. The hackers obviously were not happy that they weren't going to get their money. Uh, yes, they published, eventually published all the data on the dark net, but the employees of this company, and this was a large company, the employees of this company started receiving emails directly from the hackers. Again, the hackers were in your system. They know everything there is to know probably about your company. So they have all of your employees' contact information. The employees started receiving death threats, you know, pictures of decapitated bodies saying, this will happen to you if your company doesn't pay. Um, so yeah, it can be very traumatic in a lot of aspects where you need some, some counsel. So, you know, Scott or Claudia, do you ever find that there are situations in which you're actually negotiating with these folks? And if so, I mean, how does that play out? What are best practices? Who should be doing the negotiation? That would be Scott and his team. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we actually have uh, been doing ransom negotiations now for, for many years. Um, it, it, is, it is an art more than anything. Um, you have to remember, you, it's not, I think negotiations is a, is a misnomer because there's nothing to negotiate. It's, 
are the hackers going to, we have nothing, right? We hold no cards in our hand. We're basically just asking the hackers if they can be nice and cut the ransom in half, right? Um, so it, it, we're, there, there, there's nothing really to trade. Um, now, in most cases, um, you know, the hackers um, are willing to negotiate um, unless it's a hacking group that, as Claudia has described, that has done the due diligence. I mean, we've seen it where they've been in your system and they found your financial records. They know how much money you have in your bank account. They've already seen the, the you know, the information. So you're, you're not, how are you going to negotiate and say that you can't pay a million dollar ransom when you got 5 million sitting in the bank account and they've seen the bank statements? Um, so it all, I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios. Now I will say that the majority of the time, uh, in, for, for us, um, in all of our ransom negotiations, a hundred percent success rate in actually getting the ransom reduced. Um, and we've gotten it reduced up to 50%. But again, it, it's not really a, it's not really a negotiation. It's just an interesting discussion. Yeah. And, and Scott's group, I mean, Scott has a business wallet with Bitcoin at the ready, but Scott, why don't you describe, I mean, it's back in the day and I'm recalling about six years ago, almost to the day um, when you were making a trip to an ATM um, with your legally registered sidearm uh, to protect yourself, loading the ATM with hundred dollar bills to get some Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, we've had situations while well, this was when the ransoms were a lot smaller, um, you know, where the uh, the clients waited to the last minute and you literally have like four hours to pay the ransom before it goes up 20 times. Now, back then the ransoms were like, you know, $30,000. So yeah, in those cases, you, you don't have time. So you, we literally would go to a Bitcoin ATM machine and pump in $30,000 worth of $100 bills and uh, to hurry up and get the transaction so we can get the ransom paid before the four hour deadline. Um, you know, now the problem today is the ransom, the, you know, the, the, the um, hackers have realized they can pretty much almost ask for anything, right? Um, and so the ransoms now have gone up exponentially. Um, you know, most of them um, in the past couple of years have been in the order of about a half a million dollars, 400,000, half a million. Uh, we had one client hit last year and the ransom was 15 million. Um, so they are getting sophisticated and they're doing their due diligence. Now think about it. You know, it, even if it's a, um, a, a million dollar ransom, most people don't understand. It's not that easy to convert <laughs> U.S. currency to Bitcoins really fast, especially large dollar amounts, right? Most of the exchanges have limits on how much you can ex convert in a 24 hour period. So, you know, you have to have resources available to you and ready to go. You know, for us, we can pay a ransom on a moment's notice up to about $10 million. Yeah, so, how about that CNA financial 40 million that they paid out last year? Yeah. No, I think I'll take the opportunity to get my, my you know, obligatory Bitcoin isn't bad sort of stance in. I mean, it's interesting. You, you see, I mean, maybe this was a different story five, six years ago, but now I think it, it's interesting to see how governments are stepping into the fold, right? And if you were to go, and then Scott is spot on, I mean, whether you're a retail investor trying to go and, you know, put 50,000 in Bitcoin or you're trying to handle ransomware demand, the fact of the matter is that regulated exchanges are subject to reporting obligations and various sort of KYC obligations that are going to make this a slow process. Um, you know, you could go in and find yourself having to wait days or even weeks, perhaps, to get an account online and running and funded such that you could even try to buy digital assets through those conventional channels of a regulated exchange. And I think that speaks to the way that this is trending, right? Bitcoin is attractive, I believe, you know, in these types of situations because somebody can be sitting in a computer halfway around the world and, you know, they're not worried about, you know, being at the drop, you know, to get the duffel bag full of money and, and whether there's somebody, you know, hiding in the corner. I mean, they're just waiting to see you push a button and for the, the blockchain transaction to go through. So that's why I think this is appealing, but it's, it's interesting sort of seeing this convergence, right, of these emboldened threat actors of, you know, the sophistication that's coming up of increased governmental involvement and attention. 
Um, and then sort of the regulations that are all coming in together with cybersecurity, with how we handle data in light of a number of high profile, you know, breaches. And I think everybody in the country has been victim of some breach, whether it was a password or a credit card or something like that. Um, and it's, it's going to be a bit of a battleground. I, I really believe that over the next couple of years. I mean, how do we navigate this? And it's, it's tough. There's a lot of things to have to think through. And I, well, I mean, oh, go ahead, Scott. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, let me throw one more thing at you to, to, uh, to comment on, because uh, we just had a uh, recent attack and um, the threat actors asked for the ransom payment to be paid in bitcoins. I mean, Bitcoin is the digital standard when it comes to cryptocurrency, right? Everybody knows Bitcoin. So they wanted the ransom paid in Bitcoin, but they wanted a $20,000 service fee paid in a different type of a digital currency. Wow. So they're not quite comfortable with the other currencies yet, but you know they wanted the bulk of the payment in bitcoins, but they wanted a little bit over here. They don't want to. I mean, it's it's crazy. <laughs> you think about it. I mean, to actually be, you know, to be in a position where you're asking it paid in a digital asset that's got a more sort of stable valuation premise, right? And whether you're looking to go and have Bitcoin appreciate in value, or you know, you just want to avoid slippage, right? And you know, your Bitcoin is gone and it's half as or your crypto is half as valuable when they send it as when it's received. That's that's fascinating. Well, and yep. and that's a point you just raised, Bill, in, in terms of the the volatility. So you know, you could. And we've done this where we've had to get board authorization for the client and talk to the board. And by the, you know, you go on the board authorizes X number of amounts and Scott prepares his wallet. In the meantime, I mean, you could have the bottom drop out of the, of the market or it increase exponentially. So it's, it's a very dicey kind of situation. And, and, you know, if, if it drops and you're negotiating um, a lower price than the client expected, which is great, but then the market falls further and the Bitcoin you return to the client, I mean, it's, it's a very volatile currency and it's not like a, the steady dollar or other market basket of currencies that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd be curious, Scott, I mean, just talking about the digital asset side of things a little bit, or Claudia, I mean, how are folks actually going converting these things to dollars? I mean, I'm talking about the difficulty of businesses trying to go and buy Bitcoin. How do we know how some of these actors are actually going and able to move this and convert it into funds? Or are they just sort of, you know, holding on to these things? Are they using it to buy, you know, stuff on the dark web? What is, how is this actually being converted? Money laundering. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's basically the modern day version of money laundering. I mean, there's organizations out there that will, um, convert your Bitcoins, launder it into some other, um, you know, um, hard currency, you know, for you for a fee. There was, an, I don't know if you recall the story, and this was a couple of months ago now, Bill, where the attorney at a law firm accepted some Bitcoin payment and refused to um, spread it to uh, his partners, um, was called out on that. I mean, it's, it's, and you wonder, okay, so who was paying it? Why? And um, I know the American Bar Association is concerned about money laundering with digital currencies. And so that's a topic uh, these days. Yeah, very, very interesting. So now that we, and with my apologies with this case, I think we've, we've sufficiently explained the scope of the problem <laughs> and the audience is probably wondering, okay, well, you know, very, very happily, they, they can report they might not have yet been the victim of a cybersecurity incident what should these folks be doing to prepare? What should businesses be doing now when they don't have a ticking clock to try to get ready if this should come to pass? Well, I mean, from the, from the, um, from the simplest aspect um, certainly would be if you don't have some sort of a cyber insurance policy, you need to get one, right? Um, because most people, um, their, their normal business insurance policy does not cover this type of an attack. Um, and then as Claudia said, uh, a lot, you know, you need specialized legal counsel. So a lot of companies now are pre-engaging their cyber attorney and their forensic firm. So they already know who they're going to take, you know, call. It's kind of like the, you know, it's kind of like the, the 911 number, who are you going to call when it happens? You don't want to have to be going through the yellow pages, um, in Google, 
my mind you because that's usually you go home you get on your computer and you find uh you know a cyber attorney um so you know you want to do that now you know ultimately you want to try to obviously keep the hackers out of your environment that's off you know it's, that's the preferred thing so um you know companies do have to take proactive steps i think one of the biggest problems is management you know management um for the most part, doesn't understand IT. I, IT oftentimes doesn't understand management, right? And a lot I, I hear time and time again from senior management, well, I assume our IT staff is doing everything they need to do. I assume we have all of this stuff, you know? And then when you find out you don't, that's, um, that's when everybody's shocked. Or Windows XP is just fine. Yeah, yeah, why do I have to upgrade? Yeah. No, folks, yeah, I mean, uh, and, as we're on the Wi-Fi network, and they're all set, right? Yeah, the real problem, and and you know, even insurance is not necessarily going to be helpful when you have some insurance companies now deciding we're not going to we're not going to cover law firms, or we're not going to cover the ransom payment, or we're not going to cover healthcare, um, or now we're finding premiums are exponentially uh, higher than they were a year or two ago. And so what insurance can do to help you is absolutely get cyber coverage because you know, it sure beats paying out of your own pocket if, uh, and, and you know, it used to be not if, but when, yeah, that's still there. Um, but there are some robust technologies and Scott can, can go through them. I mean, for example, if you encrypt your data that data can be on the dark web all over the place if it's encrypted, not by the bad guys, but by you. And if the uh, decryption keys are not on the same server, um, mm -hmm. that would be um, a good step. Um, and then you, you have generally no notification obligations if the data is encrypted. So simple kinds of steps like that. Um, Multi-factor authentic, I mean, you've got a list, Scott. So why don't you run down sure. through those kinds of things? Well, and I, and I think, uh, you know, it starts with obviously companies rethinking on how they do their backups, right? Oftentimes it's just left up to IT. Well, I don't know what they do, just they back up the systems. I don't know what that means. Um, so really refocusing um, on that whole backup architecture and getting to what's called immutable backups. So it's a one-time write backup, which means once the backup is written, um, it can never be altered, which means they can't, the, the bad threat actors cannot be the ones to encrypt it. They can't get to it. Um, that always gives you that immutable backup that you know you can get back. You can get your data back because it cannot be touched. So there are plenty of systems out there. A lot of vendors have them. Um, and you can design that so that your backups are preserved. Your, you know, your backups are there. Um, you know, to this day, a lot of people still just rely on what's termed traditional antivirus. We all know it's, it's the antivirus software that we have on our systems, right? Um, oftentimes those are not good enough these days um, to defeat the threat actors. So you need some, some different type of an endpoint detection and response technology. And again, they're out there that really look at the running processes and what are these processes doing to basically leverage AI to um, detect activities that just don't seem logical. Why does this running process all of a sudden try to access this user account over here? There's no reason for it or this admin account. Yeah, um, Scott, to that point, it's sort of like you have a, a dispersed workforce, right? So yeah. that makes it even more difficult with endpoint. Yeah, all oh, the pandemic has really, you know, a lot of companies got their people up and running remotely, but the problem is, is they didn't get them up and running remotely securely. And I think that's a really, you know, important point that I'd like to kind of pivot to. I mean, we've talked about the technological things you can do, and, and this is all, you know, very, very important stuff. But I mean, you, you touched upon viruses, right? And I'd imagine, and we were joking about this earlier, you know, it, it has to be every once in a while, some employee gets an email, oh, you know, you know, click here for this important announcement or whatever the case might be. What, you know, steps should businesses take to make sure that their personnel right, are instructed upon how to go and, you know, lessen the risk here when that is the vector of attack. And then I guess also, you know, I'd be interested to know what, if anything, can businesses do to, you know, put plans in place to, you know, at least say, this is what we will do. This is the first call we'll make. This is the second thing we will do. This is how we will access our backups. Now, 
um, to prepare and, and try to reduce the risk. Yep. Incident response plan. You know, you should have it documented. What is going to be that initial response? Now, granted, you know, you're not going to have a plan for every possible different scenario attack that's going to happen, but you have your basic incident response plan. Like you said, Bill, who are you going to call? Who's your first call? Do you already have that cyber attorney's name and phone number that you can call them anytime you need them, right? Do you have that security firm? Do you have that forensic firm? Um, because again, um, you know, time is of the essence. Contact information will be shown at the end of the slides. Go, go ahead. Yeah, but, but time is of the essence, right? I, I mean, you know, we had a client who um, literally had the appropriate security tools that detected detected the hackers on Friday evening. The security tool sent off the alerts and the alarms. Nobody was watching. And so the IT staff didn't even know their system had been compromised until Monday morning when they got in at 7 a.m. and these alerts were all popping up. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's training is paramount, mm -hmm. um, obviously for phishing attacks. Yes, there's technologies out there to help um, filter phishing emails and things like that. But every time we improve the filter, the hackers improve their ability to defeat the filters. It's a common, you know, um, chase that is occurring. So really making sure you train your staff on how to recognize some of the common phishing type things. And if it just doesn't make sense, why would the, why, why would the CEO of this $2 billion company send me an email saying, can I go out and buy some iTunes gift cards? <laughs> right. I, you know, those type of things, it sounds so trivial now, but it happens. Oh yeah. Claudia, anything you'd add? Yeah. You know, I can, I can say that training does work. There, there are a couple of points here. One, um, this comes from the executive order uh, that President Biden signed, was it last week or the week before, week before, um, on incident response playbook. Um, that's how they're calling it. And um, the comment in the webinar that we did with, with the ABA on this, with, with CISA and DHS, who are, were there writing the thing uh, that was signed um, is that they're hoping for a ripple effect. And I mention that because um, the government is going to require an incident response playbook from all those that have gov government contracts. So private sector companies will, will require it. And the, the ripple effect that they're talking about probably means that those private companies that have private sector supplier vendor customers are also gonna reply those incident uh, response playbooks or plans. And I would, I would say that it's, it's one thing to have a plan, it's another thing to execute it and having that roll out and having a tabletop exercise um, is really, really important to go through that uh, as, as a drill. And the interesting consequence, and, and this happened um, last week where in a matter where we had the FBI involved, the client was so concerned about not responding improperly, forwarded to me the FBI email <laughs> saying, is this from the threat actor? And I said, mm, name at, you know, FBI.gov, that looks good, but I'll call. And it was, it was good. So that kind of skepticism is a good response in the training. That's really helpful. Um, you know, Jonathan, I'd like to then take a, a break for a second and maybe see if there's any questions that have come from the audience that we can address um, before kind of pivoting to, you know, any sort of final thoughts. Sure. Thank you, Bill. Let me. I think I flagged one in a panel here. here. Yep. There. Um, here, here's one. Uh, uh, what is the most common mistake uh, made by an IT department um, that can create opportunities for threat actors? Um, I'll take it from the IT perspective, from the technical perspective. I think, you know, if I had to boil it down, I mean, there's probably so many, I can't even think of all of them. But, you know, one of the, one of the biggest ones is just not thinking about security, you know? Um, and, and maybe it's because the CEOs um, 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 hounding the IT staff to hurry up and get a system up and running, right? Or, or get this project deployed quickly. So they, the, they don't implement the security 
that's needed. I mean, case in point, we had one client who um, management decided that they were going to outsource all of their email to Office 365, which is great. Good money saver for them. Um, so the IT staff was rushed into doing it. And the IT staff decided that they would completely deploy everything up into Office 365 and then decide what security features they were going to turn on. Well, between them uploading it and getting operational before they could even get the security turned on, the mailboxes were already breached. Yeah, and the other sort of common mistake in terms of IT departments is, is the thinking that they really know everything um, um, so that they don't have to, to, to deploy the protections that they're requiring non-IT staff to deploy because they think that they can protect themselves and, and they are often the targets. The threat actors know that the IT folks have the keys to the kingdom. That's where you, that's who you, who you target. Jonathan, I see one more question. Um, sure. um, here, uh, this is sort of a follow-up. Um, how can we be sure that the threat actors are out of your system after an incident happens? How, how do you know you're safe then after the ransom's been paid? Well, that's, I mean, that's where you really need that forensic firm to be able to come in and uh, do that investigation, um, to be able to um, scan your system, to, to find all of the uh, potential back doors that may have been placed. Um, I mean, there was one situation, um, this was a, uh, a company out West uh, where the hackers had got in, they were compromised. They got all the credit card data. Um, they caught it, they fixed it. They thought they were good. Uh, six months later, the CIO had to go to the CEO and tell them they were breached a second time because the back door was still there. So it's not a simple task. And most of your IT staff, you know, they don't have the skills and the tools um, to be able to uh, try to identify all those things. So it does take a forensic investigation um, to, to try to get to some point where you do have some comfort that your system is secure and the hackers are no longer in it. And, and here's one final thought, and I know we've got to wrap up here, but this is a situation where the Microsoft Exchange zero day um, uh, threat um, exploit happened, a hafnium exploit in March. Um, and many companies were able to deploy the patch and secure themselves, many were not. And the FBI knowing and monitoring the number of companies that had successfully deployed the patch, but and those that were still vulnerable. The FBI went to a magistrate in Texas and got a warrant to basically in the background going through ISPs, uh, finding those companies and fixing and, and pr protecting those companies and correcting those web shell exploits for them on their behalf. Um, a very, what we would call creative use of a warrant where the government actually did basically save the bacon of, of those companies. All right, um, well, maybe we can go and then just pivot real quick. Um, any closing thoughts, Scott and Claudia, um, 30 seconds each to what you'd like our, our audience to walk away with. Scott, you first. Um, I think from uh, from management standpoint, you know, you watch your money very closely. You know your bank accounts balance all the time. Start watching your IT. Start asking questions. There's tools, there's technologies and processes out there to secure your system. You just have to make sure you're doing it. And I would add that I even saw today things going, uh, proposed legislation in Pennsylvania, proposed legislation in Alabama, legislation tours are, are big on trying to fix things and sometimes they don't really know enough or they know enough to be dangerous but not helpful. Um, and so you have an incredible mishmash of laws that, that are being proposed right now. Um, so it's a dangerous, scary time for all of us. Okay. All right, well, with that, I'd like to bring this webinar to a close. I would, again, like to thank you both so much for your time and your contributions. Um, you know, really, I think it's been a great discussion and we've given folks in the audience and anyone who might be reviewing this after the fact, um, this recording will be available on Bustle's website and on YouTube, some things to think about um, as we navigate this area. 
Um, let's see the disclaimer slide. Again, this is not legal advice. If anything, I think this webinar has shown that, you know, this is a highly fact dependent, you know, situation that you might have to deal with tread carefully and with experts. These folks are out here. Um, you know, they, they have the expertise, they know what to look for. Um, so please, you know, if you fall, find yourself in this situation, um, please seek their counsel. Um, Scott, Claudia, thank you again. Thanks to everyone who, who could join today. Um, and with that, I think we will end. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Thank you.